Well, my name is Laura Aguiti. I'm the Global Talent Officer for JWT. And I'm thrilled to welcome you here this morning. Um, as one of the most senior women at JWT, the issue of nurturing and developing our senior talent, particularly creative women, is really near and dear to my heart and many of our senior leadership that are here today. We're here this morning to honor a very special woman, Helen Lanza Razor. Helen was J. Walter Thompson's and the industry's first creative talent. And um, before I turn it over to Meredith from the panel, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Helen. The year was 1911. Helen made her way to New York with a chaperone, and she did a pioneering thing. She joined J. Walter Thompson. Not only was she a brilliant creative, she ended up leading the creative department and also being a really important part of the management team of Thompson's at the time. And when her, she was there, she did a couple of things. She ensured that the women of J. Walter <coughs> Thompson in the, that time were nurtured and developed. She had different events in the, the office in order to promote women. And in her tenure, she also made J. Walter Thompson the women's agency where women were seen to be able to thrive and succeed, perhaps better than any other agency in the industry. Therefore, if we look at where we are today, <coughs> I think Helen would be disappointed. <coughs> we do not see the women in creative leadership that we expect or should have. And so the advancement of women in creative is a really important cultural challenge for all of us, and well supported and by our leadership at JWT. Therefore, we thought the best way to honor Helen was to do something in her memory. The scholarship, the Helen Lanza Raythor Scholarship, is a $250,000 commitment by J. Walter Thompson to ensure that creative women will be able to advance their studies in advertising. <coughs> we'll award five individual $10,000 scholarships over five years for a five-year program. In addition to the scholarship, we're also going in to ensure that the women participating in the program will have a paid internship with us between their junior and senior years. We'll ensure that they're supported by a mentor within JWT. We'll also ensure that they have an opportunity to join us full time and have a first look at JWT as an opportunity for their future career. Um, we are thrilled to be launching this. And we think that Helen, also known to her children as Gaga, the original Lady Gaga, um, <laughs> would be really, really thrilled and would be very proud of what she started and what we are continuing here today. So on that note, I'm going to hand it over to Meredith and the panel, and thank you again for being here. Good morning. I actually just said to Bob, I think only Bob Jeffries and JWT could get this many people out on Thursday of Cannes at this hour. And I have not yet seen a magnum of rosé, which I think is a good thing. So I want to start by saying to Laura and Jocelyn and Aaron and Bob, thank you. It is a great privilege to be here. I'm Meredith Covid-Levy and I run advertising at the New York Times. I have one, one of three women from the New York Times talking this morning. I'll introduce the other two much more important women in just a moment. But I want to start out with just a couple of factoids that are really striking to me. Um, and and I, I want to just give one more moment of appreciation to Bob for making this such a serious issue. Women aren't creative. I don't buy it. There are nine extraordinarily creative women seated behind me this morning. You're going to hear from all of them. But what I do buy is that this is a very serious issue. 21, 22 years old, we all start out, it's 50-50. And by the time you get all the way up to that C-suite, it is somewhere in the neighborhood of 7 or 8% who are women. So something is very, very wrong. We know the 3% statistic for agency creative directors. I pulled last night a statistic for the movie business that Danielle actually had swirling in my head all week that only 15% of all of the people who worked on the top 250 grossing movies of 2013 were women. So there's something very, very wrong with that. And the, the figures are staggering when it comes to earnings in both Hollywood and the creative profession. So let's, let's fix that. And to get started on the discussion, I'm going to turn around so I can introduce my panel and you can look at all of them. 
first we have Amal El Masri. So, yes, there you are, Amal, who is the Chief Strategy Officer of JWT in the MEA, which I assume is the Middle East and Africa. She is a long term brand management executive and strategist. She's got lots and lots of wins under her belt, including, as I understand, the two largest pitches or pieces of business, one in Egypt, both Vodafone and Egypt Tourism. And my fun fact on Amal is that she's also sort of a college professor. So she's a guest lecturer at the American University of Cairo, which I think is really cool. So welcome, Amal. Malena. Malena Katuli is the GM of Brand Communications at Shell, where she's been for the last four years. Before that, she was at two other little tiny companies that you may have heard of called Nestle and Novartis. Um, my fun fact, I've got two fun facts on Malena. Despite the fact that she looks so, so fabulous, she is the mom of twins, which I think is one of the hardest things and best things in the world to do. And she also speaks five languages. So we may have her answer at least one question in another language. Uh, Kat Gordon. I said to Kat this morning I was so felt so privileged to actually just be in her company. This is a woman who's done so much on women in general, women in the workplace, and marketing to women. She's an expert in marketing to women. She was on the 2010 Top 10 Women to Watch list. She, like the woman we're honoring this morning, started out as a writer. She wrote for Cosmo and also for Sports Illustrated, which I think is pretty amazing. She did a, quite a bit of agency work. She is a huge supporter of early childhood literacy. She started her own consultancy a few years ago and had big clients like Baby Center and Target. And I think most importantly, and the reason she was probably asked here, is she actually started the 3% conference, which we all really, really appreciate. So welcome to you. My first New York Times guest this morning, Danielle Mattoon. Danielle is having her first can, so she's had a lot of rosé <laughs> this week. Danielle is the culture editor of the New York Times. She's been in that role for the last year. She has a lot to say about women and whether or not we're doing enough to lead in culture. And lest you not already feel jealous of her that she's the culture editor of the New York Times, because that is a damn cool job. She spent three years prior to that being the travel editor of the New York Times. <laughs> and before that, worked both on the style department and arts and leisure. Started her career as a booker for NPR, which I think is so fun. Fun fact on her, she was a violinist in childhood and apparently played <laughs> Carnegie Hall. I'm dragging it all out. So welcome, Danielle Mattoon. Betsy Spence, we've been together twice this week. Betsy runs marketing, integrated marketing, and a little store some of you may have shopped in called Macy's. Um, huge, huge, huge um, responsibility. She is in charge of all advertising and all national brand work for Macy's. She um, has made the Macy's brand work a lot more celebrity driven, star driven, and the whole Macy's marketing team, which she leads, has done so much to bring Macy's up market. It's so exciting. We work down the street from Macy's, so I'm in there a lot. Um, my fun fact on Betsy is she not only gets to lead marketing at Macy's, but she gets to walk in the Thanksgiving Day Parade, which she will be doing this year. And before Macy's, she did two great stints at, at Merkley and Ogilvy, and I think is the only Stanford MBA on our panel, which impresses me. So welcome, Betsy. Valerie Chang. Welcome, Valerie. Valerie's Chief Creative Officer of JWT, started her career. I love this, and I knew you were going to be young. Specializing in digital. Most of us are too old to have started our careers specializing in digital. She's on the Leo Burnett Global Creative Board. She is a member of the Singapore and a leader at the Singapore 4As. She's been on the board of the Webbies. She's worked on tons of big clients like SAP, Visa, HP, Burger King, and P&G. She's an AAF Hall of Fame member from 11 and 12, and she was named Digital Creative Director of the Year in 2012. And this is the best factoid on all of them. If she could do any other job, it would be zookeeper, I am told. <laughs> I love that. Polly Chu, Chief Creative Officer, JWT Beijing for the last six years. For that, worked at Saatchi and Saatchi. This is my favorite factoid on you. Holly Chu was the 2006, everybody get ready, China ad man of the year. <laughs> Somebody will have to explain that to me. She was a consultant for the 2008 Beijing Olympics, started her career in Hong Kong, Shanghai, Guangzhou, 
and this is awesome. She has won 51 awards, including numerous silver and gold lions. That is so cool. And I have to tell you, my son is studying Mandarin, my three-year-old son. <laughs> Maureen Dowd, least known person on the panel. <laughs> Maureen Dowd, I'm going to say, is the single most famous New York Times columnist ever. She is a columnist who typically spends her work covering politics and gender issues, but has recently done a field trip to Colorado that some of you may want to ask her about. <laughs> this is my favorite factoid. New York Magazine described her as gorgeous, charming, and a little bit ridiculous. <laughs> she has a special relationship with both Bushes, very different relationships with one and two. And she is, and this is staggering, and we're going to get into this, I think one of only three major, two major New York Times columnists today, but three like in recent memory and history, which is troubling, and we'll, we'll probe into that. D, Maureen, we are so... Who are women? Who are women? Sorry. Missed that part. There are more than three New York Times columnists. We're hiring for columnists. D. Solomon, my good friend, CMO of Media Link. Prior to that, SVP of Marketing and Sales at Condé Digital. Love this about Dee. She's always so fashionable because she ran um, creative and advertising at Donna Karen. She went to Berkeley, and her shoes still sort of smack a little bit of Berkeley. Before that, before that, she worked in banking, which I think brings the, the sort of serious side of Dee. And of everybody on the panel, I'm, she's the one that I can say for sure she knows how to throw a fabulous dinner party. So I think that's all of you. Um, thank you so much for being here. And I'm going to start with the question that I think we all pretend we don't want to have to answer anymore, but that I think is the central question. Why aren't there more women creative in the context of work and life balance. So I'm going to ask specifically how do top women executive creative directors master work-life balance and if you don't mind I'm actually going to start with you. So please talk to us a little bit about what it's like to be a creative director, someone who's worked in digital for a long time and what's the situation with work-life balance. I think it's quite funny when I got, yeah, obviously we, I, we've seen the questions earlier and, and I told, um, I was sharing with my team that the truth is there is no work-life balance, at least not in Asia. <laughs> um, and I think but how you deal with it is um, you can't, I mean, there's no way that I can say I, I, I can just stick to an eight-hour day. So I will be working 12 hours, 16 hours from Mondays to Fridays, but I can at least make sure that the weekends are for my kids. And we, you know, if you count work-life balance in terms of quantity of hours, or do you count, uh, is it more important to look at the quality that, of time that you spend with them and your family? So I think that's, you know, in that sense, you know, I'm crossing my fingers every day, my kids are turning out fine. Um, I think that's probably uh, a good sign that things are still working, even if I you know, I don't get the quantity of work-life balance right. I hope I got the quality of work-life balance right. So. so I want to say awesome. I started with Valerie because we did ask everybody to, to share some thoughts prior to the panel. And I knew she was going to answer the question so honestly. There is no work-life balance, at least from her perspective. And what you're saying is it's trade-offs. Polly, also in a similar role, how do you feel about it? Do you agree? Is there work-life balance? Um, I do agree with Valerie that in Asia, especially in China, we glorify suffering. So whoever enjoy life, oh, you know, this is not a very good workers or employees, right? <laughs> so we, whoever, you know, suffering, we cry, we, you know, like feel sympathy and then, okay, go to back, back to work. So this is our mentality. It is very difficult to correct that kind of mentality because you know, in, in terms of history, we go through all those sufferings and all those wars and then now, even though the life is better or the economy is better, the mentality is still there. So we still glorify that part. So there's no balance of life there. But however, you know, now since the economy is better, people started to talk about it. 
talk about it. Okay, so we we may not uh, have funds to be like uh, glorifying, uh, enjoy or enjoy of life or how lifestyle should be. But however, people do strike a balance, trying to strike a balance now. That's for men. For women. Mm. <laughs> we're waiting. Yeah. Yeah. So we're our, still waiting. So we're we're waiting. I'm all, I want to I want to do all the creative directors first. So Ma, give us your sense of this. Or is there work life balance? I'm not a creative director, but um, and I'm not married and I don't have children. But other than that. Other than that. I think <laughs> <laughs> other than that, I think the. Uh, uh, as I said, I'm single and the work-life balance is really, really hard. Yeah. Uh, but we ping-pong back and forth and it works and we're happy doing it. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I'll, I'll just say, I do think the conversation always sort of tends to go to moms. And I know so many executive women who are not moms for whom the, these issues are just as big. Betsy, you mentioned the other day the notion of caring for aging parents as being part of this. Do you have, have thoughts on this? Well, I don't think this is on. I think so. I don't think I don't think there's work-life balance in this business for men or for women. Um, I mean, I know many men creative directors who, you know, one one friend of mine said, you know, I say, Joe, how are you? My wife hates me. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> my wife hates me. My kids hate me. I never see them. I mean, it is not. You know, it is not an industry that is family friendly. It's just not. You know, you're probably journalism is, is the same, but you're at the mercy of, you know, sometimes ridiculous demands from clients, crazy deadlines, long hours. So I don't think it's good for anybody. I think one of the issues is that for women, because they have to shoulder probably more of the burden of childcare, managing things at home, um, it makes it more difficult for women. And, uh, you know, without, I think, a, if you are married and if you have kids, if you don't have a supportive partner or spouse, then it's even harder. So, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know how it's going to change unless you fundamentally change the business model and the nature of how agencies are set up. Well, well said, and we're going to come back to that topic. I want to go to Danielle. Danielle, you um, mentioned to me in the context of this question the notion of it's very hard to not take your own experience as a working mother and sort of apply that to the people who work for you in how you think about their work-life balance. So tell, tell us what your thoughts are around that. Yeah, so I think we all agree that we want to bring up younger women. And I do think that um, my, my personal history is I think that I've had an easier go of it than the women who have, who have spoken. I've had a little more control over my life. Um, but having had two children in management positions, you then are in the position of being a mother, managing other people going through early parenthood. Um, and I think it's very hard for you, you have to check yourself not to bring your own history into how you manage others. For example, if you worked through morning sickness or if your husband um, was absent, you don't have as much tolerance for people who don't do that, which is fundamentally unfair. And so I think that, um, what would help us all if there was some institutional conversation and support about these very particular issues. I was telling Meredith before that I was managing a man um, who, who, he wasn't sick, but his wife was, and he was taking time, and there were other women who resented that. Um, and so it's just, there, all of these issues are very, very personal. Um, everyone has a different dynamic at home. Um, and everyone, I think it's a personal decision how you manage every single employee, employee who's going through these things. Sorry about that. So on, on the notion of, of personal decisions and work-life balance, Melina, you have twins. How old are they? 18 months. 18 months. Oh my gosh. So how are you doing it? How are you pulling it off? Um, losing out the control freakness of me, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, understanding that uh, you need a good support system, as we was told, and then make sure you trust the people that you have at home when you're not, or the people you have at work when you're not, uh, which is not easy for women to do. Uh, we want to be present on every single detail, and it's complicated. So the guilt comes at work, and the guilt comes at home. Uh, but we just need to let it go and, and focus. And I think there is something around fluidity as well. So this Monday through Friday, 
holidays, not holidays. There is, you know, balance doesn't really exist. Mm -hmm. So I work and I and I and, and 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 that's part of my life, and I take that as a fact and I just go go on with it. That's it. I love it. It's about fluidity. Does anybody else want to cat? Do you want to comment on that? Um, the sort of great mashup we're all experiencing yeah. between our personal and professional lives. Yeah, um, I don't know how many people here have read Arianna Huffington's new book, Thrive. Yep. Um, I encourage you to do so. She talks about how um, we've only defined success as power and money, and that the third metric is actually the thing that's been missing, and that's personal fulfillment. Um, I actually just wrote a piece for our blog called Why We Overvalue Overwork, and it was this aha I had that as creative leaders, you never know when you're finished. There's no sense of completion because you can always do something else. You know, if you're a doctor, you're done looking at the scans, or if you're a chef, you've, you know, reduced the sauce. But when are we done? There's no finish line. And I actually have a friend that was working at like 2 a.m. tinkering on a presentation, and the creative director came over and whispered in her ear, do you know what the high-pitched sound of perfection sounds like? And she looked at him and he said, there isn't one, just print it. <laughs> so awesome. I, think, I think we need to have hard stops because otherwise there are no stops in advertising, ever. <laughs> What's a hard stop? Give, give to, a hard give stop is I'm going to be on the train at 6.30. A hard stop is I have a nanny to relieve. A hard stop is boundaries. We live in a boundaryless world. Yes. <laughs> well said. So I want to go to Maureen Dowd. Well said, Dad. I want to go to Maureen. Maureen shared an anecdote with me earlier in the week about the notion that if her, um, if the people who lead the opinion pages of the Times call a woman on a Friday and say, do you want to write a column about XYZ, the woman usually says, I can't because my husband has to be somewhere and my kids need this, etc. Whereas if they call the man, they say, yep, it'll be done on Monday. So Maureen, talk, give us some context for why have there only been two famous women columnists at the New York Times of late? Well, in a way, I think, can you guys hear me? Yeah. In a way, I think it can be easier for writers at certain points of their career. Like when I started, I was covering Bush One, and he had the personality as a Chinese diplomat said of ants on a hot pan. <laughs> so we were traveling. He, he thought going to Japan was a day trip. So you're on the road all the time as a White House reporter. But at other times of your career, for instance, I took care of my mom the last two years before she died, and I could go to work every day in black yoga pants, and nobody cared because writers can be slobs. You know, it's not like we have to take meetings and look great. So, and Anna Quinlan, for instance, had this amazing career because she had a family, then she wrote about her family, then she got famous writing about her family, and it was a perfect symbiosis. Yeah. Awesome. But I was telling Meredith, as you know, the trouble, you know, the Times only has two women opinion columnists, and this is a problem with women generally of how do we get more women to mouth off? And, um, <laughs> you know, like guys trash talk on the basketball team, and, you know, there are many more male bloggers. And a friend of mine who runs the Washington Post opinion page said when she calls women and, and says, I need, you know, something on Iraq by tomorrow, the woman will say, well, let me think about it. I'm not sure exactly what I want to say. And also, my husband and I are going away this weekend. Then she'll call a guy, and he'll go, yeah, I'll cancel, the, <coughs> I'll cancel my vacation, <laughs> and I'll do it right now. I know exactly what I want to say. And so, you know, not that doesn't apply to all men and women, but in general, she saw that as a trend. So um, I just would like to say, I didn't tell Meredith this the other day, but part of the reason it's I think it's hard for women is, it's hard for men too, like uh, Armando Iannucci, the creator of Veep, said yesterday that, you know, he gets all of this trash talk online about his work, and he said it's like walking into a room where people are saying horrible things about you all the time, so why would you walk into that room? But the difference with women is if you're in the business of critiquing, um, then the criticism you get back tends to be much more about your looks and sexuality than it does with men. And it, it's even though you steal yourself, you know, it's really hard when you get emails like you hideous old bat, you know, you are writing this about the president 
that he shouldn't go into Iraq because he wouldn't date you if he could. <laughs> you know, like you're not good enough to date him, so therefore you think he shouldn't go into Iraq. So with men, you know, like Tom Friedman will say he should go into Iraq and people will agree or disagree on the policy. But with me, it's like, you know, get a facelift and shut up. So, so that's why I'm not even sure I would recommend this life to a woman because of that. But uh, anyway, so that's one thing. But that being said, we still have to get to parity, you know. Well said. So, <laughs> Dee Solomon, I know you agree with Maureen Dowd. So how, I know you agree. How do we get more women to mouth off? Give them a mic. I, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's not just mouthing off. It's, it's who's in the room listening. And, and I want to thank the men who are here today, because <laughs> oftentimes we find ourselves sitting on a panel, a women's panel, and I look out into the audience and it's only women. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we're holding up a mirror to ourselves and we don't <laughs> always need that. Um, we really need men to understand and be open to change and, uh, and to hear our stories. So, um, so, you know, thanks for listening to us mouth off. <laughs> uh, the only other thing I'll say on the subject is that it's helpful to have technology, that you know, technology helps us mouth off as well, and um, this, is, this is a wonderful experience to be able to have the personal energy of, you know, in, in a room. We're very fortunate to have blogs and, and Instagram and all, all the other mechanisms that we have to spread the word and to develop much, much better opinions of women um, over time. More platforms to mouth off on, I like that. <laughs> I'm gonna, I, I, and I think it's right. Um, I'm gonna go to Danielle now, and I'm gonna ask the hard question. You are the culture editor for the New York Times. You evaluate creativity all day long. Are women perceived as less creative than men? And if so, why? I don't think so. I really don't. I mean, I think that they are less representative in many creative fields. But I was thinking of, you know, who, who are the huge creative voices of today? And it's Beyonce, it's Miley Cyrus, it's um, Taylor Swift. It's like, there, there are plenty of women who have a lot to say. They're young women. And I, I, there's no doubt in my mind that women are as creative as men. I think certain fields have favored men for a long time. And that's changing. That's what we're talking about today. But in terms of sort of intrinsic um, potential, there's no, there's not a fight, really. And I think women have to be more creative and wily in terms of how they get heard than men. Um, so I think in a way, their, their, um, their creativity is much more particular to them and interesting to me. Um, so to me, it's not, it's not really an issue about whether they're creative, it's just about being heard. And I, I love the fact that we probably have the wiliest yeah. um, <laughs> columnist on earth here, and she's certainly made a, a name doing that. So I'm going to go to you, Polly, and ask. You're a creative director. You were named Ad Man of the Year. <laughs> Still not over that. Um, so is it about how, how do we behave with more wily? How do we, how do we get heard more? I think this is a very interesting question because, um, well, put our situation uh, um, in China as an example, I don't think women is perceived as uh, less creative. <coughs> it's because less women are in the top part of the management in creative area. So there's less people got hurt. That, that's the problem. And then on the other hand, I think girls are, you know, like all women, are, um, are not as aggressive, seen as aggressive as uh, men, unless we really need it. But then, you know, like uh, when people got, uh, got a statement, women are less hurt. I think that's the, that's the problem. It's not just about, you know, like uh, uh, we are not creative. Like m some of my clients, um, they see us as more creative. We are multitask. Mm -hmm. We are more multitask, multi-talent. Guys, just focus on one thing. <laughs> <laughs> That, that is a huge point, and I actually want to go back to Dee Solomon on this because she said this very same thing to me yesterday, that perhaps the issue 
is that we are forced to multitask. D. Yeah, I, I, and, and this is just a small thought, but I do think that multitasking is, is to some degree the enemy of creativity. Um, and women are forced to multitask, and in doing so, I think it helps in certain aspects of, of career life. Obviously, we're really good at managing a lot of things. I think it's helpful for insight because it gives us the ability to see a lot of things and bring insight to, to the discussion. But when it comes to creative, there's something about focus. And the truly creative people that I've known have always been able to shut out other things and deal with um, the situation. I think that's especially true with artists. If you take a look at the way artists work, they shut themselves in the studio, and, and that's not real life. And, and it really works to the disadvantage of women creatives. Well said. So I want to I wanna add one more dimension to this conversation, which is nine women, huge jobs, big pulpits. What can we do to actually bring the other women up behind us? And embedded in that, I want you to comment on, I'm going to start with Maureen, do women actually support one another? Are we doing enough to support one another? Well, it's funny, you mentioned Hollywood, and Alessandra Stanley, our TV critic, has a, a great dry sense of humor, and, and she always says that um, women only get top jobs like Hollywood studio chiefs and um, TV anchors once the men have decided those industries are no longer as important. <laughs> so once the <laughs> industries are on the way, and it's like, okay, go ahead, Diane Sawyer, you can have it. <laughs> and I love that comment. And um, I don't know, you know, when we talked about this yesterday, I, I feel guilty because I have brought it up with my bosses. I think we've obviously got to have half of our columnists have to be women. But I don't, I don't know exactly how to make it happen, except I'm talking about it publicly, and I'm talking to them about it privately. And I mentor young women all the time, and, um, you know, they're fantastic. And, I, you know, writing is just not gender uh, specific. You know, women and men can be great writers and great storytellers in an equal degree. So I just feel like I'm lucky in that way in our profession. But um, I don't know. We just have to try harder, I guess. No, I don't think anybody can argue with that. <laughs> Kat, you yes. founded a conference on this premise. Um, what does trying harder look like? What does it mean? How do we support one another more and bring more women up behind um, us? Well, I said on a panel the other day that I actually think the press perpetuates <coughs> the notion that women don't help each other, brought to you by the same people that bring us the mommy wars. I don't buy it at all. I had the idea for the 3% conference. I was one person. No one was bankrolling me. People like Nancy Hill and Cindy Gallup got behind, opened doors. Everything that's mobilized that movement has been goodwill from other women. Everything. Um, I want to say that I don't think there are enough women to mentor the women. So men, you're needed. And um, I attended a Sheryl Sandberg event last night, I don't know if any of you were there, but she talked about how men are reluctant to be seen at dinner with young women because it looks unsavory. So they don't mentor the young women, they mentor wow. the young men. So if you get asked to lunch for 45 minutes, and the guy gets to go to a two-hour dinner, or he gets to go on the trip with you, or on the golf outing with you, who gets the promotion? Because who's had more face time? So I would encourage men in the group to get over it. Um, let people wink behind your back. Those young women need you more than you would ever know. Well said. Maureen, please. I was, I was just going to say, I do have to say, sadly, you know, there are some women who don't help other women. And without naming names, I would say that one time I wanted to get this woman hired, and uh, so uh, the woman I had to go to said to me, well, I don't think we can hire her because that would make three important women in the same place. And, and I said, and yes. And she goes, well, three can be a very dangerous number. And I was like, what, what are you talking about, a coven? <laughs> Masses. You know, so some women can inculcate, you know, that, and, yeah, you know, it isn't all, you, you, it is mostly, in my experience, women helping women, but some women have to be educated, too. Well said, well said. Um, Betsy, how do, what can you do? You're, you know, running marketing at a huge company. What can you do 
with your agency to actually see that more women get into creative roles? Well, it's interesting because, you know, at Macy's we're always talking about the need for increased diversity in, you know, in all of our fashion books and publications and our advertising, um, more diversity in the people that we hire. But it is funny that we are a fashion business and yet our senior creative team, our ECDs are men, have always been men. They're great. Nothing against <laughs> nothing against John and Andy, but you know, I mean I guess as a client I could say, where are the where are the women? You know? We're a fashion business. We want a woman, you know, women creatives yeah. on our business. And I think also getting back to the fundamental structure of agencies, by design, they encourage people to leave. You know, if you're a creative you're supposed to build your portfolio so you can leverage it into a higher paying, better job at another agency. And it's considered not a good thing to stay at one agency too long throughout your career if you're a creative. So at some point, women are dropping off and leaving. And I think it's important to understand when that happens to try to prevent it. Well said, well said. So let's go, we brought up, someone brought up, um, I think it might have been Polly, sort of corporate cultures that enable or fail to enable us to, to get to better places. And all, you're a strategist. Um, you, you think about that for a living. What can we do to change culture in the agency business and, and more broadly in business to see more women leaders rise? Yeah. Honestly? Yes. <laughs> no. Honestly, I think uh, it's very useful to talk about um, employment and mentoring yeah. and nurturing women. But I think the, the, the really tougher issue to, to, to deal with um, are the very ingrained things uh, on stereotypes and stereotypes of women. Uh, we're in a communication business and we're talking about women inside our walls, but we also need to look at what we're communicating outside of our walls. And, um, um, if we look back, I mean, not the people in the room, but if we look back on, we've spent decades and decades and decades um, shaping certain stereotypes of women. Yeah. And um, I, I, I'm sure we did, did it with good intention, the keenness to be relevant to our audiences throughout different times, uh, just perpetuated um, the, these stereotypes. And I think as a group, if we want to address it, we need to first, you know, sit and say, we're maybe not so proud of our past uh, <coughs> in this specific area and, and how much of a commitment are we going to make to really change these um, stereotypes. Uh, w one last thing, I think there, there have been enough studies to show that stereotypes affect the person themselves. Yeah. Yeah? And that's been proven over and over. So an equally creative person is always on the back foot when they've got that uh, uh, stereotype um, sort of... Uh, conditioned in, in that culture. So th these are, I think, they're the really, really hard things, and it takes a serious commitment to say, you know, as an industry and with our clients, we are going to be um, very committed to unshape what we played a very big role in shaping. Well said. I think we've got a, a question in the front of the room, and then I do want Danielle Mattoon to come back. We'll give you a little time to think about it because we'll go to a question and just address that because I think stereotypes aren't just in advertising, they're all over the culture, so. And I, I really love that comment, and as certainly some, as a creative leader in this industry, one of the things that I think is important to consider in that context is not just the stereotypes of women, but the stereotypes of men. Yes. And uh, I, I know during my career, as well as trying to help women, I've fought against stereotypes of men that aren't portrayed as being allowed to be in the home, or aren't portrayed to be as good fathers, and, aren't, and I think that affects the decisions that men make and and it makes it less able for them to sort of step away when they may want to. You know, I, I got so sick of seeing laundry ads with dads putting the laundry powder in the fridge. It's like, <laughs> it's like, it's like as if you're some kind of idiot, you know. And I think, um, I think when we attack it from both sides, then if we free men up to go, all right, well, actually, I don't have to behave the way that I have been my whole career because there's no pressure on me to do that now. Mm -hmm. Then I can step back and maybe some women can actually take the job that I feel obliged to take. So I think there's so much to do and I think for me I've always thought it's not just a stand up for women, I've got to stand up for men in a different way, not you know, not say get bigger jobs. So I just want to sort of add that to the mix. Right on.
Right on. I think we have two more questions, so we'll go to those, and then I actually have a question for Valerie. Uh, I have a question about you know troubleshooting the road, and I I'm in my at that point I'm thinking about the family, and as are many women around my age, and the conversations we are having are about paternity leaves and time off and you know job security when you come back, and I've had so many creators talk about going to Google, going to Facebook because they just have better paternity leaves and you know five months also for the men, also for the women. In our industry, like I feel like we haven't yet talked about corporate policy changes, mm -hmm. and you know what are we doing about that? Like, advertising is notorious with really bad um, policies. Have you seen in your experience, or Kat, specifically for yeah. you, have you seen you know all these conversations lead to actual change in policies or? Right. Um, Actually, on my way to Cannes, I stopped in Stockholm and spoke to Ingo there, which is an Ogilvy Gray agency, and they were giving me a tour of their agency, and the creative director, who's a woman, she was chastising one of the art directors for being there. She's like, you're supposed to be on paternity leave, and she basically sent him home, <coughs> and that struck me more than anything else at their agency, um, so I think you're absolutely right, and one of the things we have a... Uh, 50 things your agency can do for diversity list we put together and one of them is having a stated maternity and paternity leave or even like a woman who's pregnant you make what's called a birth plan where you hope to figure out how you're gonna give birth with a doula or whatever no one has a job plan like you're leaving your agency why don't you sit down with your boss or HR and how could it look for me do I have other older children do I have help at home um, maybe come back a little bit later. Babies don't sleep through the night till they're about four months old, but most agencies need you back within six weeks. Relax that, and if you save that one employee, that's a great investment. Awesome. So I, I want to go to Valerie. You made a really interesting comment in our prep work for this about culture, and I'm, I'm actually going to read it because it's so striking. P&G in Singapore has this work-from-home policy on Fridays. That would be great. But it doesn't work, and I think this actually goes to Matt's point, it doesn't work if the rest of the agency is here in the office. If you make it official and applicable across the whole office, that would work. Give us a little more on that. Just, you know, I mean, I had the pleasure of working with them, and I literally had clients telling me, oh, we can't, work on, we can't meet on Fridays because we all have to work from home. And, um, and I think that sort of forces you to, you're still efficient, you're still doing their work, but at least they're doing it in the comfort of being with the family, with the kids. The other thing that they have was they, they made sure that we do not, they don't schedule meetings after 3 p.m. On, you know, on, on weekdays too if they try to because, because there's a tendency to schedule meetings at 5 and 6 and then that, that's how it stretches and then you try to finish off the day and then it gets longer and longer. So I think things like that, when you make it official, then everybody get on it. It's like public holidays. Yeah. When you when the government has public holidays, everybody switches off. When you're taking leave, people just creep into your life. So, you know, it's you know. So I think I think as an organization, small things like that, if you implement it and saying no meetings after five p.m., it's like creative saying no briefs after five p.m. So at least. It, it, it makes sure that you don't extend your days unnecessarily, you know, things can be, if you, if you put a boundary, people will work within the boundary, yeah. but when there's no boundaries, you know, just everything breaks loose. It's amazing, it goes back actually to what, what Betsy said earlier, so I actually want to take one more question from one of the most extraordinary women in the room who's led lots of other women up the chain, Nancy Hill, who runs 4-8. I want to make a comment and then I do have a question for the group. And the comment is on this work from home policy. When I got to the forays, we didn't have it. And I had a lot of uh, young mothers who were trying to bring into the organization. So I created um, this policy that you could work from home, one in some cases, two days a week. But what I found was if I didn't do it, then the organization didn't believe that it was possible. So I, for those people who are trying to institute those policies, it has to start at the top because they will model your behavior, and if you aren't willing to do it, then nobody else will do it. So my question to the group is this. One of the things I found is that as we program conferences and we're trying to put together speakers, almost every time, the first people to say yes are men. Yep. And the women, by the time I get to like the last month, maybe I can get the women. So then, of course, we're promoting, and I put a list out there. I get chastised because there aren't enough women on the list. 
I've written about this pretty publicly, but why are women so bad at self-promotion? So I, I'll, I'd love to. Please solve yeah. it. Please answer yeah. that. <laughs> um, Shelly Zalas, who is a great champion of women um, in the workforce and women in general, says that women need to promote in other women two things, confidence and generosity. And I think the generosity thing, Nancy, when, you know, giving women an opportunity is, is, is great. The confidence part is something I think we still need to work on. And uh, obviously we all, all need to personally work on generosity, but women don't always have the confidence to stand up in front of large groups of people and share their ideas. And I think that's something that I don't actually know where it comes from. I don't know where, why it is that men are more practiced at it or more comfortable at it from a young age, but I see it and I, I think it's something that we really need to address at an earlier age for women. So, so Dee, on that note, I want to go back to Maureen Dowd, who I think is an icon of confidence and standing up for what she believes. <laughs> I, I have no confidence. <laughs> I didn't do it today, but usually I have to take a Xanax just to get on stage to talk because I'm so terrified. But um, I, I just have one funny factoid about this, which is over the years, I constantly get emails from guys saying, that was interesting what you wrote. I think you'd like to read what I wrote about it. And I have never gotten that email from a woman ever. And I get it practically every day from men saying, here's what I think, or you want to read, this is what I wrote. And, um, you know, in a way, Sheryl Sandberg's book is kind of, it has a lot of good tips, but it's depressing too, because she says when a woman asks for a salary raise, she should smile a lot. And it's just kind of, you know, wow, is that, where, you know, is that where we are? But um, Ava yesterday had a great, um, on, when we were talking to this woman and she was saying that she offered a woman a job on her team and the woman goes, great, yes. And so Ava said, no, you've got to negotiate with me. <laughs> you've got to bargain and you have to ask what your benefits are. And so she's trying to tell her how to negotiate with her, you know? So we need more women like Ava. Amazing, Ava's the head of brand at, at Philips. So last point, Danielle Mattoon, you, I, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say, you drive a lot of what people think of the culture. And I wanna go back to that stereotypes issue and say, what is, what, how do we get um, images and, and ideas of more confident women across our culture? That's an interesting and complex question. I mean, I started one of the, my earlier jobs at Details Magazine, and so every month we would talk about the cover, and there was always a sexy woman on the cover, and I was one of two women on the editorial sort of decision-making team, and I was witness to these conversations, like, we can't put so-and-so on the cover. She looks like a horse. Her butt is so big. I mean, it was unbelievable. Um, and I think we sort of, I'm, I'm no longer working in a men's magazine, but it, so it's different. <laughs> but Donna Winter does that too. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. It's true. It's true. Yeah. Down. Yeah. Um, I mean, there was an interesting, uh, Miley Cyrus, you probably also heard the MTV Awards in September, and she took a lot of flack for basically working. Working, there's the word I was looking for. Um, and, um, and the images were very, very um, suggestive and provocative. Um, but we had a critic basically say, like, it's her right to act this way um, in what she's doing. I mean, he, not everyone agreed with this point of view, but it, she's being defiant about who she is, and she's finally taking a stand and saying, I'm not this, t like, teen TV star, and so she's acting out in a way that suits her message. So he was basically saying this is her choice, and for us to judge her according to what she's doing, um, we should check ourselves on that. So I think that um, as, a, as somebody who's looking at culture every day, um, it's not up to me to mediate and say that these images are sort of not appropriate or she shouldn't be doing this. 
Um, but I do think it's up to the New York Times to try to give readers a context in which to understand that. So I don't think, if, if there are other things that we should be doing, please tell me, but I think that's our role, um, is to give you an intelligent context in which to understand these images, but not to bar these images from readers. Well said. So let me wrap with some of the best comments that you guys made. Valerie, there is no work balance, and Polly followed that by saying, um, we glorify suffering, at least in part of the world, <laughs> but people are starting to talk about it. Betsy reminded us it's not just that there's no work-life balance, but there's no work-life balance for men or for women. Danielle, I love the notion of don't bring your own history into how you manage others. And I think a lot of you said this is about getting institutional support. Milena said it's all about fluidity from a mom of 18-month-old twins. Amazing. Kat. Personal fulfillment is missing, and we need hard stops if we're going to get it. Maureen said, Bush one is like ants on a hot pan. <laughs> and the best thing, I think, that was said so far was, how do we get more women to mouth off? I hate the fact that if you're in the business of critiquing, that the critiques that you get are more personal, and we should all do something about that. Dee said it's not just mouthing off, it's making sure the right people are listening. I'm gonna introduce Bob in a minute. He is certainly the right kind of person and he is listening. Danielle said we need to be more wily about how we do what we do. And Polly said even still, women are just less heard. That really troubles me and is something we can, we can all work on. Dee said, love this Dee, this is a big insight. Multitasking is the enemy of creativity and multitasking is something women do too much of. Um, I love this. Maureen said, women only get the top jobs when men decide that the industries are no longer important. <laughs> Kat said, uh, the press perpetuates the notion that women don't help one another. I agree with that. I've been helped by so many women in my own career. And Amal said, stereotypes drive so much of this. Matt. Thank you for let's actually release the men from their stereotypes. Valerie said, make it official. And finally, and I love this, perfect ending comment, Danielle said, let's actually all check ourselves a little bit on the judgment of one another. So with that, I want to thank the nine of you. What an extraordinary conversation. And I want to introduce the man who actually invited us all here this morning, who runs probably the best known agency on earth and who runs it so beautifully that he is, in addition to being the worldwide CEO of JWT, he's also a television personality often commenting on our business. So thanks, Meredith. That was fantastic. And thanks to all of you. Um, it's interesting. This originally started as an exciting opportunity with 150 to launch the Helen Lansom Razor uh, Scholarship, which we felt, again, it's the 150th. It's been a moment of reflection for us on how do we get back to our pioneering roots. Helen was the first female creative director. She did a lot of first. She was the first one to use celebrity photographers and so on. But frankly, it also, you know, the past holds up a mirror to the present. And it's depressing, I mean, not just from a JWT point of view, but from an industry point of view about how uh, little women are represented in senior management. So I think what's been exciting about this conversation is that it's really the start of something that we, JWT, are committed to, but frankly, the whole industry has to be committed to. And I think, I think Meredith, or somebody said this before, I mean, we have Gustavo Martinez here, who's going to be the next global CEO of JWT. We have Roy Haddad, who's the godfather of the Mideast in Africa, <laughs> Michael Madel, who's a leader in the company, Tom, who runs Asia Pacific. I now understand you when I heard Polly said, we glorify, <laughs> we glorify <laughs> suffering. <laughs> so, but again, I think, you know, I don't have much to say because I'm overwhelmed. I think this was really great and really inspiring. I felt like it was a learning experience for me as well. So the proof will be in our behavior and uh, the changes that we, we need to make. So again, thanks to all of you and have a great week at camp.